Thank you very much. Really nice to see everyone here in person and hello to all on the Zoom. Um, and thank you, Manuele, for arranging this invitation. Um, yeah, also fantastic to meet somebody who I've only ever seen and see the office that I've seen so many times on Zoom as well. Um, so yeah, we've been working for um, quite some time now on local access and manufacturing of diagnostics, which I'll discuss a little bit in my talk, but um, I'm going to be a bit more general about um, global manufacturing of reagents and enzymes for molecular biology, which hopefully will kind of chime with many of you working on similar topics. So I'm based in the Department of Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology at the University of Cambridge, but collaborate extensively with colleagues in Latin America and Africa for much of this work, um, also some colleagues in the Philippines. Um, and so I um, typically really look at biology as a mode of, of manufacturing. So this is kind of, the, with credit to William Gibson, the idea is that biology is the future of sustainable manufacturing, not only of enzymes, but also of biologics, of many interesting biomaterials um, and many high value chemicals. And that future is already here. We can already manufacture a lot of stuff with, with biotechnology. Obviously, we've had decades of experience of manufacturing, many health technologies and many um, kind of other other materials, but there's there's a lot more on the horizon as we try to move away from petrochemical based um, manufacturing of chemicals, for example. So the future is already here in terms of the technology, but access to that technology is not very evenly distributed. And so to just look a little bit for an example at the um, COVID diagnostic innovation, which is something that Emanuela and I have been working on as part of the um, local production and diagnostics working group. Um, this is a map of the sort of number of tests that were innovated during COVID-19. It was published in 2021, so probably slightly out of date right now, but you can see a very clear pattern that the majority of COVID-19 diagnostic innovation was really happening in Europe, North America, and parts of Asia, primarily um, China and India, um, but very little in Latin America, Africa, and um, other parts of Asia that do not already have established biotechnology industry, which makes sense. So I guess the question is, you know, where, what are we seeing in terms of the research? Well, pretty much the same. So I'm, I work using synthetic biology approaches, which is just taking an engineering um, approach to synthetic biology, but it's really not a complete kind of paradigm shift from, from molecular biology. The techniques are very much the same. It's just some of the approaches are a little different. But if we look at synthetic biology as a field, um, you know, really the majority of papers, the vast majority of papers are, are from outside of low and middle income countries. I exclude China from that number because China are actually the third largest um, country of publishing synthetic biology papers. Um, but, but you can see there's quite, quite a marked difference. And if we look at kind of supply chains as well, we see pretty much the same pattern. So this is export of laboratory reagents in 2018, which is a, is a proxy for the reagents being manufactured in that locality. It's not an ideal proxy, but again, you can pretty much see the same pattern, limited activity in Latin America, Africa, and, and a sort of vast swathes of Asia, and then a real concentration in North America, Europe, Russia, China, India, and Australia. Um, but interestingly enough, this is um, kind, of, kind of contrary to having the freedom to operate within biotechnology. So the ability to innovate with the knowledge and technologies that we already have. Um, so there are 14 million patents in the world, <laughs> according to lens.org, which is a patent database. Um, but 99% of those have rights in fewer than 20 countries and only 1% are registered in the global south. So a lot of extremely cutting edge biotechnologies um, in terms of kind of having the freedom to innovate, um, that our colleagues in, in the global south have actually an excellent advantage in some cases in terms of being able to, to use this technology that is effectively in the public domain within their region. So for those who don't know so much about how patents work, once you register a patent, you have to choose which countries it's active in. And if you want to innovate and use that patented technology outside of those countries, that's absolutely fine as long as you don't export it to somewhere where the patent is in force. So something I always kind of try and impress on people is that as well as the scientific literature, which is an excellent source of technological knowledge, the patent literature is sometimes an underexplored space. And actually a lot of that knowledge can be directly applied with minimal kind of transaction costs or licensing issues 
if you're um, based in the global south, but having the freedom to operate doesn't necessarily equate to having the means to capabilities to infrastructure to innovate with these technologies. Um, and this is all patents, but I mean, it's pretty representative of biotech as well. Um, so what does my lab do in this in this kind of space? So, so that we need to do something perhaps differently to enable innovation to happen with biotechnology. And one of the challenges that we really see is in terms of kind of supply chains and the value chain for biomanufacturing um, being challenging, challenging to access outside of high income countries. And so my group, some of whom are represented here, um, we're trying to build this globally inclusive biomanufacturing value chain using um, open source enabling technologies. So technologies that anybody can use. So we primarily produce toolkits that are completely and deliberately not patented and mostly use um, parts and DNA sequences and enzymes that are no longer patented or never were in the first place to kind of amplify and maximize that freedom to operate. Um, but we really look at sort of three main areas. So. How can we create these circular economies of resources so that you can um, manufa manufacture biological reagents and technologies sustainably, ideally using kind of non-toxic, locally available materials that are not very dependent on a small number of manufacturers or difficult and fragile supply chains, um, shortening those supply chains. So specifically, we look at can we manufacture more of these important reagents in country rather than having them shipped from North America or Europe or China to wherever in the world they need to be. And this has a number of advantages. Obviously, it is physically shorter. <laughs> so that means it's less time for reagents to arrive at scientist lab benches. And typically speaking, our colleagues in Africa and Latin America uh, on a good day would wait a couple of weeks for pretty much anything to arrive. Um, but that can extend easily to months. Um, they also, it's also cheaper if you can cut down the shipping costs. It's environmentally more friendly and you're also more likely to get a working reagent because the cold chain is more likely to be stable than if you're shipping long distances. Um, and as an added advantage in most countries, you are getting um, lower costs due to not having to pay import taxes if you're manufacturing in the country. So, so we're really sort of looking at how can we use distributed manufacturing of these reagents to sort of shorten that and make it more robust. And I think even those of us who work in high income economies have um, really seen the fragility of supply chains for biological reagents during COVID. But what we experienced in terms of shortages of access to pipet tips and PCR reagents and all that is, is really kind of a day-to-day -day reality for most scientists and biologists working in the global south. And then the third kind of arm of that is really thinking about um, not only sort of distributed manufacturing, but also how much can we do sort of agile, just in time, on demand production of stuff? Um, because if you have, if you're looking at kind of small demand or prototyping an innovation level of biomanufacturing, you don't necessarily want to be doing enormous batches. So what technologies can we bring to play that allow us to really um, change the system so that it's not manufacturing necessarily, you know, 100 litres of something, but you can actually do real micro manufacturing and make it economically feasible and useful, ultimately. So, so sort of three of the areas where we focus are making these open toolkits for distributed manufacturing. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more later about one of our projects, which is the open enzyme collections. This is basically uh, plates of DNA that you can get, which contain um, the DNA for over 60 useful enzymes. So it's all kind of stuff you would use in the lab, a bunch of DNA polymerases, RNA polymerases, also got some restriction enzymes in there. Um, so, and DNA parts, regulatory elements, terminators, affinity tags, for manufacturing essential research reagents. We then try and apply some of those tools to address sustainable development goals. A very natural transition is of course diagnostic development because the enzymes that we manufacture or plan to manufacture for research use um, are also used in diagnostics. So one of the projects we have ongoing at the moment is developing a lamp CRISPR based um, assay for typhoid in partnership with collaborators in Cameroon. Um, so we kind of we, we do, the, do the tool manufacturing, we kind of demonstrate use cases for the manufacturing, and then we also look at policy. So how can we kind of change some of the, the policy and where investment goes in order to really um, support these fundamental infrastructural uh, improvements mm -hmm. to enable more people to do molecular biology and biotechnology in more places. 
So I'll talk a little bit more about why we chose to focus on open source technologies. Um, so for those who are less familiar with the term, you've probably come across it in the context of software, but it has broader definition. This is probably one of the broadest definitions you'll find, um, but it's, this is from a, a kind of open ICT for development uh, definition from the International Development Research Centre. But there are really kind of three aspects of, of open source and why we use it. So one is universal access. So I already mentioned we try and use technologies that are free of patent encumbrances. Um, and we make sure that those molecular tools are accessible, not only in terms of patents, but also anyone who's, who's worked long enough in a, in a molecular biology project will have ended up signing material transfer agreements, which basically if another laboratory ships you plasmids or ships you samples, typically um, it comes with various clauses about what you can and can't do. And ordinarily that includes you can't give this to your neighboring lab. <laughs> to another institution. It usually also includes you can't use this for commercial purposes. We generally want the absolute opposite for all of the stuff that we make. So we want people to share it with their colleagues um, at other institutions. And we definitely want people to be able to manufacture it for use, which includes commercial use and setting up local businesses. So we, we have um, tools in place to enable legal tools to enable us to do that. Um, we really look to kind of increase the involvement of stakeholders in shaping the projects that use these tools. So uh, kind of the definition from IDRC is this idea of universal participation, which for us doesn't necessarily mean universal. We don't do so much citizen science, but we really we work with researchers um, who are active in biology and biotechnology in low and middle income countries. And so it's extremely important <laughs> that those colleagues are involved in all of our work as collaborative producers of knowledge and of tools and of technologies. So we have multiple partners working together for a common goal. And often those partners include people from outside of the technical research space. So the group that Emanuele and I are is a good example of that. But we have people from the World Health Organization. We have people from UNDP. We have people from NGOs, from civil society. So really looking at kind of what is the goal of this research, whether it's increasing capacity to do biotechnology in a specific context or whether it's producing a diagnostic that can be deployed within a particular healthcare system and that creates a sustainable market access. You know, all of these kind of require people beyond scientists. So we try and collaborate with multiple partners on that. Um, so that's sort of the approach, but why do we do it? Well, it accelerates the R&D if we're not trying to put effort into keeping things secret or contained or controlled, then it reduces a lot of friction. We can send materials around much more easily. The lawyers have to get involved less often, which helps us speed things up. Um, and everything is kind of available for people to take and build on. Um, it also means that, you know, not everybody has to replicate work. So we used to can sort of spread the load, for example, of testing the open enzyme collection. There's now a number of labs who are all working on different parts of the collection and testing different enzymes, testing different purification methods and pulling that data back into um, what will is not now very discoverable, but will soon be, be a much more discoverable resource that others can feed into as well. Um, the other idea is user innovation. So, you know, if you if you make a technology more available and you also give people the ability to collaborate with you on shaping that technology, you're going to get more diverse ideas and also expand the pool of developers. And this is really something that open source software practices have taught us. Um, but an example I can give you is, you know, with collaborations in Ethiopia, for, ex for example, um, we've worked a lot on DNA pol polymerase production, but when we're, we're now um, applying the same sort of techniques in thinking through production of proteases for the leather industry in Ethiopia, which was really a result of a local need due to new sustainability standards that mean that, you know, Ethiopian leather producers want to use more enzymatic routes to process the leather. And also my collaborators, having had experience with the polymerases and real, you know, realizing and having the tools and capabilities to say, well, we can just swap the polymerase out for a protease and give that a go. And so it's, it's, it's kind of the fundamental tools angle is kind of nice to be, <laughs> to be involved in because you see stuff that you've done being taken, taken in different directions that you didn't think of. And that's amazing. So, um, and then the final thing is we, we, if we're not kind of, um, we can really focus on on sort of the value add. So, you know, we have a system for sharing all of these tools and reagents, and then really our time is spent on 
How do we share the know-how, the tacit knowledge of how to actually do this stuff in the lab, which as we're all familiar is quite a difficult thing to get across, especially in the last two years, but we haven't been able to deliver in-person training. Um, how to set up really good and equitable collaborations. We're always learning and improving there and, and focusing on, you know, what's the impact of this technology? So that's why we take that approach. I already mentioned that does involve us using different legal tools, for example, the open material transfer agreement, which I won't go through because I just basically gave you the explanation in a nutshell, but this is how we make sure that all of our DNA is shipped around the world. And at the last count, we've had our, the kit was out in over 200 laboratories in over 40 countries, and it's all gone out under the open material transfer agreement. And I know that's only people who've directly ordered the kit. So we know that, for example, collaborators that we work with in Latin America have been handing it out to their to other institutions. So we, we're only seeing a portion of the actual um, distribution, and that's that's facilitated by tools like the Open Material Transfer Agreement. So to go a little bit more into kind of how we design the technologies for biomanufacturing. So we know they're open, but <laughs> what do they actually look like? Um, well, we really focus on um, biomanufacturing techniques that are deployable in kind of standard molecular biology labs um, and that produce molecular biology reagents which are fit for the context of use. So we focus really on ambient temperature storage of everything. Um, I, was I just arrived back, I guess, the Friday before last from two weeks in Cameroon where you know, the electricity was off most days in the lab for a few hours um well if you're lucky not for much time but we were i think we're unlucky we number one <laughs> so it was down for two to three hours a day and one day the whole day so so having ambient temperature storage um for, for reagents is really helpful um having non-toxic readily accessible chemicals um an example of this which i'll come to later is that uh instead of using iptg which is a, a chemical often used to induce recombinant protein expression um, our system now just uses dried milk, which is pretty much available everywhere and contains large amounts of lactose, which is a kind of, basically IPTG is a kind of mimic of lactose or, or byproduct of lactose. Uh, also making the biology do the heavy lifting is another principle that we go with. If you can get the biology to produce stuff itself, because it's very good at that, then all the better. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, but here's a, a, a uh, example from a paper with collaborators at the University of Texas Austin where we produced molecular biology reagents basically without purifications. This is kind of the extreme end of not needing much lab equipment or downstream processing is expressing um, thermostable enzymes in E. coli and then basically pelleting, washing and drying them down in a, in a silica kind of sealed container rather than a full lyophilizer. Um, and they're stable for seven months at room temperature and they work perfectly fine for routine PCR. Um, so that for at least for training and kind of basic research where you know you've got a robust PCR, it's not too sensitive, it's not needing too much troubleshooting. These are great. Obviously, you might want to go a little bit more pure for some of your trickier experiments. And certainly for diagnostics, there's a whole extra set of steps that you would require. And that's something that we're still kind of building up in terms of how do we do we do quality control, but how do we do kind of quality control that we would be happy about using in a medical context is kind of a next stage. Um, this is an example of producing uh, restriction enzymes and other markers in cell-free extract. So we mostly produce in E. coli. Uh, however, for some things, E. coli is not a great, uh, it's not a great host, particularly for restriction enzymes, because they're quite toxic and um, somewhat difficult to optimize. Um, but cell free extract is basically where you break apart the E. coli and take out the cytosol, add in some um, energy mixes, add in some um, ribosomes sometimes, depending on what you're producing, and basically creates a kind of in vitro bio factory, um, which in itself is actually very stable at room temperature. So these were actually stored for three months at room temperature or three days at 40 degrees C. And you can see that they're still expressing in this case, just oh, sorry, back. in this case, just the marker LAC-Z. But we've also tried this with production of enzymes as well, and it works pretty well. And the advantage of this is basically you have just a dried down little mini biofactory that you can ship anywhere. So you have a tube of your desiccated um, cell free extract. You have desiccated DNA coding for whatever you want to produce. 
Um, and then you add some water, mix them together, and hey presto, in you know a few hours, you've got your protein. So this is a really nice system for prototyping and very small scale manufacture. But it doesn't beat E. coli in terms of volume. So, um, so I've already mentioned auto induction using milk. Um, you can see that we actually just just use milk in this case, but we've recently switched to dry milk because it's more, it's more readily available everywhere. Um, but you can you can see that there's basically oh, sorry, I keep pressing the middle button instead of the laser. There we go. Um, so yeah, you can see here that there's pretty good expression um, of our open vent enzyme here, which is a DNA polymerase. Um, using auto induction media. Um, we're also exploring, but um, I haven't included data because it's a work in progress, autolysis of the cells as well. So producing um, uh, an, a protein within the cell themselves that once you freeze thaw it, it autolyzes uh, the membrane. So you don't have to have lysis reagents added afterwards. Um, and we've, we've got quite a good system going with auto hydrolysis. So you also don't then need to add DNAs into the mixture because you produce a small amount, isolate it to the periplasm. And then when you lyse the cells, it gets released and digests all of your contaminating genomic DNA. So this, we actually did it as a light inducible system for testing purposes, but um, column one is a, is a DNA extraction from, from a, from a classic cell lysis and number two is with with the light switched on <laughs> so we've got the auto hydrolysis is that it's in the dark in the light and it completely goes um, so that is very helpful because it reduces the viscosity of your protein extract and again it's one less input i mean if you don't need to make another enzyme and affinity purify it and add it why not have it just in one pot so we're trying to basically make a system where it's as simple as possible to make things um, using e coli E. coli is not always the best host, but it's what we started with and we're sort of sticking with it. We have collaborators who work a lot more in Bacillus subtilis, which has some exact advantages in that you can secrete the proteins and actually gather them from the media. Um, and also advantages in that it can form spores, which themselves are very stable and, and very shippable. So um, we're not ruling out other hosts, but for now, we pretty much focus on E. coli. Um, so that's just an example of some of the technologies. I try not to be too technology heavy in this presentation, but I'm very happy to take questions at the end. Um, so, so we have some of these technologies. What does that actually look like in, in low and middle income countries? And what have we learned from deploying it? Well, interesting. Um, so what we learned quite rapidly from working with colleagues in Cameroon was that actually the auto induction in the shake flasks was was okay, but shaking incubators are quite heavy. They often literally have concrete in the bottom of them to stop them shaking around on the bench. So some of the labs that we're collaborating with did not have their own shaking incubator. They actually built one in Cameroon out of um, some local engineers helped them make one out of laser cut acrylic and, and motors and a microprocessor. So they can do it, but also, if you're doing shake flasks, what you really want is quite a large centrifuge, <laughs> which are also quite heavy and expensive to ship and quite difficult to maintain versus a small kind of bench top micro centrifuge, which you'll typically find in all labs. And so, um, yeah, our colleagues were spending a lot of time putting their shaken cultures into tiny tubes because their centrifuge wasn't big enough. So we started expressing um, using auto induction media that I just showed you. Uh, here, so the auto induction using milk. One of the disadvantages of doing this in a shake flask is it goes all cloudy, um, which makes it difficult to measure your optical density. So it was never a perfect system in any case, um, but we've sort of solved that by basically making auto induction agar, and now we express the proteins on a Petri dish. Um, and so this is E. coli, it was a video um, which has not translated into the downloaded PowerPoint, but um, it's basically a Petri dish that's covered in BL21 DE3 E. coli, expressing um, open vent, which I mentioned before, it's our favorite DNA polymerase, it's much better than TAC. Um, so it's, um, it's expressing on here, and then you can just take a glass slide, or in this case, my postdoc cura, or um, the former postdoc cura has a razor blade, but the glass slide is safer. And you can scrape the biomass off of the Petri dish and pop it straight into a very small tube for downstream processing. Um, so again, just removing one more step in the process that is not a barrier in a high resource lab, but can be a barrier elsewhere to just getting started. So um, you can see in the video, it basically comes off extremely cleanly and then you have a lovely uh, sort of clear, much clearer um, 
petri dish after you've scraped everything off. Um, and this is the result. So from one plate, again, you can see the, um, this is a liquid culture. This is a plate, so actually very little difference, really a bit more in the liquid culture, to be honest. But I mean, this is a lot of protein right here. One plate gives you thousands of PCR reactions uh, worth of enzyme. And that's just one plate incubated overnight. I mean, you spread in the evening, you come back in the morning, you scrape it off, you put it in a tube. If you use the no purification route, you don't really even have to do much more with it, to be honest, at that point, you just wash it and um, divide it into the right kind of number of cells per tube and then dry it down. But you can then obviously take it through to anything you want, affinity chromatography, ammonium sulfate salting out. If you have, you know, downstream HPLC, et cetera, et cetera, it's all fine. Um, but we do try and focus more in, in our group on the slightly um, less equipment heavy downstream processing. Um, so, so that was a sort of, kind of change that we made in terms of um, better adapting to our collaborators' needs in Cameroon. Um, and, and I think this is one of the, just to kind of take a diversion to talk a little bit about how we work in terms of collaboration. This is probably one of the most challenging things that we have in terms of doing a good job with the technology that we're developing. One is the kind of coordination challenge of people and things and just shipping stuff to the right people in the right state is a challenge. Okay. Um, navigating resources and power and, and collaborative approaches and cultural differences is always a challenge. And also documentation between remote settings. Months can get lost to poor documentation and documenting, documenting know-how is really hard. I would not say we have anywhere near a perfect system. <laughs> We're always trying to improve, but these are three of the things that we found most challenging. And the problem with distributed manufacturing, which is in the title of the talk and is something that we're very interested in doing, is if this is a problem with one set of collaborators that you've worked with continuously for three years, if you suddenly start having this stuff um, manufactured as we aim to, at, you know, tens to eventually hundreds of different labs, all of these challenges become a lot more complex. Um, and so we're still trying to figure out structures and ways in which we can make this easier because the goal is that ultimately anybody who's currently having to wait three months for their enzymes to arrive can reasonably easily manufacture what they need in their lab. Um, and yeah, scaling up that to ensure that everybody has what they need is quite difficult. But it's important because what we want to end up doing is reducing dependencies. There's currently almost in complete dependence of most countries in the global south on receiving reagents from the north and this as we have seen during covid does not always function well um, and so we're really interested in kind of how do we provide the means of production for these tools um, considering like what comes next what's the end game one of the reasons that we want everything to be distributed openly is if i change career or my guys something happens to the initiative that the dna the tools and the information are out there someone can pick it up and run with it and then finally, how do we kind of balance local autonomy and local production and local capabilities against the inevitable globalization? Because we're not, we, we are still dependent, you know, we, we've made a lot of equipment in Cameroon, for example, not just the shaking incubator, but we've made transilluminators, we've made other basic lab equipment. All the electronics come from China, of course they do. <laughs> so, so there's sort of, in terms of supply chains, you can never say everything is local, but where are the kind of key points um, that you can uh, pick apart and say, actually, this is the important thing. And the reason we went on enzymes as a first step is because, because of the cold chain requirements, because they're quite sensitive to being shipped, and because they're so much more expensive than, it, than the actual cost of goods in terms of making them. I mean, you've just seen what it took to make tens of thousands of these <coughs> PCR reactions. Um, the bacteria replicate themselves, so they're quite cheap. LBA gar, not so expensive, bit of dried milk. You know, this is not expensive technology and yet if you look at the equivalent of what people would pay on the market we think it could open up even just to have you know more access to this stuff for some creative and fun projects or for education um, is really important as well um, so just to illustrate we have a collaboration with mobile lab where we've actually set up a non-profit called beneficial bio which is supporting um, some of this work in the background you can see the lab in cameroon um, and the idea here is basically that uh, the Beneficial Bio, which is a network of labs, works to man start manufacturing the toolkits that have come out of my lab to make it affordable, accessible reagents and provide support and training locally. And the, the kind of hope is that will 
um, increase research productivity, which hopefully, again, will increase some investment in innovation activity and then increase demand. And we'll see this sort of positive cycle. But, you know, this is all a hypothesis <laughs> and something that we're experimenting with. Um, so in Magoa Lab in Cameroon, um, they, the team run training and they manufacture hardware. These are the transilluminators that I mentioned, which were fully made in Cameroon. Um, production, so here is some open vent that they've expressed and just run a, a quick PCR. Um, and also they're now selling those reagents locally as well. So the goal is by 2023 to have the lab self-sustaining itself on local revenue generation uh, with some grants for R&D projects, but, um, but the core should be funded. And that's important because um, it also means that grant money, which is hard won in Cameroon, is actually being invested into local businesses that are paying local taxes, employing local scientists, rather than being sent immediately outside of the country. So the idea is to have much more of these sort of local economies for some of these tools. Um, and so just some pictures here from the lab of the team at work. Actually, in the old lab, we have a new uh, production facility now, which just got set up while I was there. And I haven't had yet time to, to chop and edit the video down to show you the production facility, but it looks a lot um, more, more professional. We've actually turned this lab now into a training lab. Um, and these are some of the products that they're selling to Cameroonian students and research centers. So master mixes for PCR, and then the two, um, our favorite open vent DNA polymerase. So just, just an example there of kind of how they've taken basically an open source product that was developed in my lab. And also I should say, we, we did the design of the collection, but it was actually synthesized by the excellent Free Genes Project at Stanford in the US. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of <laughs> plug this again later, but if you want any of this DNA right now, it is completely free. So you can log on to stanford.freegenes.org and order it, even the shipping is free. It will literally arrive at your door. That won't last forever, <laughs> but while they still have funding, um, it's, it's being shipped around the world. Um, so that's, that's sort of one of the examples of collaborations. We also work with Cameroon on the typhoid diagnostic and have students um, working on kind of testing that with clinical samples and, and a, there's a whole bunch of R&D that's going on, but I wanted to illustrate a little, a little bit more here, the kind of journey from having a toolkit and a set of technologies through to having something that's kind of quickly become a product that's manufactured locally. Um, so what does this collection look like? I've mentioned it several times. Um, so it's basically a number of uh, enzymes, already mentioned polymerases, ligases, reverse transcriptases, over 60 of those. Um, there's various kind of cleavage sites, reporters. We ha actually have more reporters than, than reported here. Um, the Open Reports collection now has, I think, 50 different reporters, um, chroma proteins, fluorescent proteins, and somatic reporters, a whole bunch of affinity tags. Um, and you can order this, as mentioned, from Free Genes. It arrives under the Open MTA, um, and then you can go ahead and use it. We're actually working right now on having a, some sort of, this is a collection of parts that you can assemble. And this is really where the sort of idea of building blocks and synthetic biology and DNA assembly comes in. Um, but we are working on a collection of ready to express plasmids that you can just put into your E. coli and go. Uh, they're not quite ready for prime time yet, but we're hopeful in the next few weeks. They're also, I should say, not only available at Free Genes, but also an Ad Gene, which is a non-profit plasmid repository as well. Um, ah, something's gone wrong with the uh, text here, but you can basically see we, we provide a sandbox of nearly 200 interchangeable elements. And then um, it's up to, apart from where we've decided, because we've made some ready to express um, plasmids, it's up to the scientists to decide, you know, what have they got available for affinity chromatography? For example, you can put in the relevant tag. We also have interesting tags and, and numerous collaborations or close um, colleagues working on using affinity purification to lower cost materials. So most people would be using um, an iMac column or other kind of metal um, iron based purification using his tags. We have silica binding domains, which means you can use silica particles or which can quite easily be extracted from sand, for example. Um, we also have cellulose binding tags in there as well, in case you want to um, immobilize things to paper. And we're working on a few other sort of one one stop chromatography columns um, that should be manufacturable through just using the toolkit. 
Um, but you can decide, you can build your own reports. And of course, you can swap out any of these. So I already mentioned the example of, you know, we provide a limited set of CDSs, but once you've got the sandbox and you've got some training and you've got the kind of set of resources that you need, there is nothing to stop a lab swapping this out for something that they're more interested in. And that's definitely what we hope. Um, you see a big pattern at the minute of really, really interesting. I mean, I love it. I love an extremophile. I really think they're fascinating. And we work with a number of countries that have extremely extreme environments, for example, Ethiopia, where they've got super hot alkaline hot springs in the north of the country. And there's some just some weird and wonderful biology there. But <clears throat> unfortunately, the common pattern is that the organisms will be found in somewhere like Ethiopia and then actually the sort of recombinant protein expression and the molecular biology happens elsewhere and so we're really hoping to kind of build capacity with colleagues at the Ethiopian Biotechnology Institute to say oh hey okay you found an interesting organism you probably will have to ship it out to get sequenced although they do have sequencing capacity coming online and um, but once you know what it is um, you know to actually put it in and express it and do the characterization sort of autonomously within the institutes will be um, a really nice thing. Um, I mentioned we have a sort of sub collection of ready to express plasmids. That's part of the reclone collection. We do already have some ready to express plasmids, but <clears throat> we did this collection during lockdown, which meant that our lab time was very limited. And when they came, we realized that the um, there was an unforeseen challenge with the backbone. So we're swapping them all out again, hence they're not fully available yet. Um, but this is a sort of boutique collection specifically for research and diagnostics. Um, it's, it's been used already for joint research into SARS-CoV-2 diagnostics in Chile and Peru. It's been used in an XPRIZE um, finalist test and it's underpinning a kind of synthetic biology and diagnostics course that we're currently developing with colleagues in the UK, Ghana, Cameroon, Ethiopia and South Africa. Um, and so it's kind of the, the sort of edited highlights of the open enzyme collection and reporter collection. Um, and we're also interested not only in enzymes, but also other interesting um, biological products. So we had a project um, that's just wrapped up, um, but I have a student coming in to sort of finalize the details. Um, but we have a, a project, had a project called Amplify, which was looking at on-demand production and immobilization of antimicrobial peptides in cell-free extract and then directly immobilizing them onto hydrogels. So there's some quite interesting stuff you can do even outside the enzyme space using a similar kind of concept and set of techniques. Um, so basically in the future, we really want to kind of bring all this together and have sort of hyper-local discovery innovation manufacturing. So as I already mentioned, find some really interesting biodiversity, figure out what's there, put it into the collection as a module, and then be able to kind of recombine that. And we, we work with a number of colleagues who are very interested in kind of automation and having um, what's known as a bio foundry or DNA foundries in different places that enable you to do some of this combinatorial work more um, quickly, because uh, that's a lot of the petting. If you've got 200 DNA parts and you want to make different combinations because you're not sure which linker is the best linker for your protein and affinity tag, for example, um, we're able to scale up through through using robots to do some of the hard work. Um, then thinking about you know prototyping in the cell free systems that I mentioned because they're really rapid. You can have protein within a few hours. You can test and characterize it, and then move it into your um, in vivo system if you want to express an E. coli or whatever else. And so really just trying to kind of bring some of this approach of engineering with biology um, to to a much kind of uh, a lower cost and a more a more democratized spread across the globe um, and so i just end with sort of i mentioned dependency a number of times and that really comes from this um very distinguished philosopher pauline hantonji from benin who talked in 1990 which is a very long time ago about scientific dependence in africa um, and really talks about kind of some of the challenges being around in scientific investigation some of the really important stuff comes from you know, the interpretation of the raw information and the gathering of the raw information with experiments. Um, and that, you know, one of the challenges of African science is really not having the kind of production of the means of production of knowledge. So not making the research instruments or the microscopes locally, in some senses shouldn't matter, but actually often does, particularly I think when you've got more black box instruments in molecular biology where they quite easily break down. A number of our colleagues have you know, lab equipment that just just doesn't work anymore and it's very difficult to fix um, and so so we're sort of taking this idea through to the reagent space 
um, and just you know finally to think about why, why is it important well it's important because it really holds up the practical kind of conduct of biotechnology research and biological research around the world i mean universally 100 percent of people <laughs> so that we that we interviewed working in global south countries uh, have issues with getting access to the tools that they need but when you have a scarcity of tools if you think about perhaps the number of experiments that you might do in a higher income country for fun or as a side project or maybe it will work maybe i'll just try that if you're in a very constrained environment it's really difficult to do a well i'll just try it type of experiment and so a director of a research institute in ghana said to me you know what i really want is just to give my students a bunch of pcr reagents and say go away and kind of do some cool science and have fun, but I can't because we don't have sufficient reagents that I can just do that. And so when they have to graduate in a year, so we're picking, you know, I end up picking projects that are frankly not very high risk because if they're high risk and innovative, then, you know, they're going to fail. And if they fail and you've got to wait four weeks for the new primers to be delivered, and then another four weeks for an enzyme that you've realized you need, it, may, it means everything kind of is, is has to be, planned to a much greater extent than those like myself who've been privileged to work in pretty high resourced institutions for the all of my academic career don't have to think about on a daily basis and so it kind of I kind of it moved beyond the practicalities really into kind of how people think about their science and so this is a nice quote i think from Uruka Akeke who talks about western west african molecular microbiology and really that you know at the core of these debates about access to facilities and laboratory performance is really this sort of hidden debate about who can who can dream and where and, and by dream she really means like there's an aspiration aspect to that but there's also a creativity aspect to it that it's much there, there's a certain type of creativity that you need to survive in a resource constrained environment um, but there's a whole bunch of other types of creativity that are really difficult to access and you know whether you're working on basic discovery driven science or whether you're working on technology driven applications, there's, you really kind of need that latitude to be able to do stuff that is not, you know, the, the kind of thing you thought about three months ago when you placed your reagent order, <laughs> you want that adaptability. And so this is another reason we think it's important to have um, the kind of local agility to make these reagents in country. Um, and I will end there, but that was sort of a whistle stop tour of some of the concepts behind the work that we do in my lab, a little bit about the technology and happy to go into more detail. I didn't want to spend too long. I've already spent 45 minutes. Um, and then a little bit more about some of the partnerships that we've built up, um, just a snapshot of, of the activities. But yes, thank you very much for listening. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you.